Yes, uh, we are now uh, live streaming. Uh, Profilo, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are audible, sir. Yeah, thank you. So, yes, uh, we are now uh, live streaming. Now, uh, live streaming. Namaskar. Namaskar. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, great to see you uh, all with us today. Uh, let me at the outset uh, introduce uh, the Indian Futures very briefly, uh, as I always do. Uh, we are a New Delhi-based uh, independent think tank that started out our journey in uh, January 2016 uh, with the sole aim to creating a global but very India-centric platform to plainly and dispassionately discuss in the truest ancient Bharatiya tradition of a Samvad, the ideas of New India, we at the Indian Future seek to go beyond the headlines of the day and have a very honest, deep dive conversation amongst the thinking community in India and abroad. We have hosted, uh, as, you would, as many of you would know, uh, some of India's and world's finest minds uh, from the world of diplomacy, academia, politics, culture, uh, for example, uh, we recently had the Ministry uh, Ministry of External Affairs (MOS) Sri V. Murli Dharan, uh, the ICCR President Dr. Vinay Sastra uh, former Foreign Secretaries uh, Sham Saran, uh, Sri Vijay Gokhale, uh, Ms. Nirupama Menon Rao, uh, Ambassador Kamal Sibyl. Uh, we also have had the pleasure of hosting uh, Professor Sri Raja Mohan, uh, Professor Makran Paranjpe, my friend Professor Harsh Pant, uh, Dr. Aparna Pandey from Hudson and Richard Russo from CSIS Washington DC. Uh, please do join us on Facebook, Insta, Twitter and YouTube uh, at, uh, at the rate uh, Indian Futures uh, for all our uh, past and upcoming programs. Uh, we are all here to make sense of the Quad Leaders Summit uh, held last Friday, uh, that was 24th uh, in Washington DC, uh, which was uh, obviously the first in person and rather surprisingly for many analysts and in fact decision makers in global capitals uh, rather uh, very quickly uh, after the 12th March virtual summit uh, this year. Uh, there are two documents uh, on the summit uh, which one should uh, look into. Uh, one is obviously the joint statement uh, released after the summit but also the fact sheet uh, released by the White House. Uh, joint statement uh, uh, which has come out uh, is in uh, 17 uh, largely uneven paragraphs and if one passes through it uh, some things that immediately struck me uh, the first and foremost was the key operative statement and I quote here from the joint statement uh, quote uh, together uh, we recommit to promoting the free open rules based order rooted in international law and undaunted by coercion uh, to bolster security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Quote closed. And uh, the joint statement identifies progress made in three core areas that were identified in March, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, climate change and emerging technologies. Uh, but this uh, summit also saw the launch very importantly of uh, the Quad Infrastructure Partnership. Uh, and again, the focus on cyberspace, outer space, uh, very importantly, Quad Fellowship on STEM but also uh, a full paragraph on Afghanistan. Uh, it makes sense, uh, obviously, after the uh, American withdrawal, uh, but also a paragraph on North Korea and Myanmar. The Quad Leader Summit, uh, uh, in fact, is truly a historic one. And as I would see it uh, as a world order defining, refining and shaping diplomacy at the highest level. Uh, surely not just a hype and not a sea foam as many saw it or hope to uh, see it, uh, uh, I will see its trajectory uh, that way. So uh, some important uh, questions uh, immediately are thrown up uh, by the summit. Uh, what sort of strategic signaling uh, to allies and advise adversaries in the Indo-Pacific? 
uh, one can uh, see uh, and are the quad countries are the quad partners really up for the long game the related question obviously uh, strategic hedging by indo pacific powers uh, do they really uh, want uh, to be seen as making choices uh, us led uh, china led uh, what about asean centrality and within asean are all uh, all the countries on the same page uh, the answer is obvious uh, another point of discussion uh, and questions being asked uh, in the commentary uh, is about deliverables uh, is the quad joint statement too ambitious to deliver one it better if they could have identified just three four things and just stuck to them and actually bother to deliver them uh, the other important uh, issues about institutionalization what is going to be the way ahead uh, is formalization uh, a better answer a better way and again this talk about habits of cooperation so uh, obviously uh, there is uh, the level of relationship between uh, different uh, bilaterals is uh, the intensity is quite different uh, bilateral or even in the trilateral format so how uh, does one bridge uh, or get uh, combine those synergies in a much effective way uh, another very important question uh, uh, which is at at some level at the fundamental uh, 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 at, at at the fundamental of the sole initiative of this this uh, diplomacy is the uh, the ability of democracies uh, so uh, what what exactly is the state intent what exactly is the state capacity and what level of domestic support is there for really getting into this sort of mode vis-a-vis uh, -vis china uh, amongst the quad countries themselves so i think these are uh, very uh, uh, these are these are the, some of the uh, questions i have really flagged for uh, our panelists today and i'm extremely delighted and honored to have really i mean i could really uh, couldn't think of uh, these uh, four really top class analysts uh, each of them uh, really uh, bringing very original ideas to the fore so we begin with obviously ambassador gautam bambawale uh, he has served as the indian ambassador to bhutan uh, from august uh, august 2014 to december 2015 and was also the high commissioner uh, of india to pakistan and later a very important tenure as uh, the ambassador to china in fact uh, he has just published a new volume uh, which is obviously perfectly timed titled rising to the china challenge uh, published just uh, last uh, i mean couple of days ago by rupa publications uh, along with uh, vijay kelkar ajit ranade ragnath mashilkar and others uh, and it flows out of a widely acknowledged policy paper of the pune international center uh, thank you ambassador as always uh, as always it's an honor to have you with us uh, speak uh, today we are equally fortunate and delighted to have uh, lieutenant general narsimhan with us uh, sir has been awarded four times for his uh, outstanding contribution uh, to the indian army by the president of india he served uh, as the defense attache uh, in the embassy of uh, india in china for 3 years uh, very importantly he is member of the national security advisory board now and uh, the dg of uh, the center for contemporary china studies which is the mea think tank uh, he is also mea division Uh, he is also a distinguished fellow uh, with the center for epa studies uh, in delhi uh, i uh, thank you sir for joining us today for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, we also have with us uh, joining from australia uh, honorable miss lisa singh uh, she is in fact uh, the uh, director and ceo of the australia india institute uh, the university of melbourne's uh, center uh, dedicated to promoting support for an understanding of the bilateral relationship uh, she is also the deputy chair of the australia india council Uh, she was uh, the senator uh, for uh, for Tasmania from uh, 2011 to 2019. So great to have you with us, uh, Miss Lisa Singh. And uh, last and uh, not the least is Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan, uh, my colleague in my center. Uh, he is a professor in the Center for International Politics, where I, where I also teach diplomacy, uh, and in the School of International Studies, JNU. Uh, he has a PhD from the City University of New York, and previously was a senior fellow at the ORF. and research fellow at the idsa uh, he also served very a uh, very significant tenure uh, as deputy secretary in the national security council uh, secretary at government of india so uh, great to have you all with us and as uh, we had discussed with our uh, distinguished speakers uh, we would like uh, each uh, of you to make initial remarks for about uh, 10 minutes or so and then we move up to the q and a uh, uh, initiated by me and then we move to uh, open up to other participants as well later so uh, without further ado i hand over the virtual floor uh, to ambassador bombawale uh, over to you sir
professor dabade first of all let me thank you for the warm welcome and i'm delighted to be back with the india futures uh, on your on your um, um, platform to once again talk about a very important subject namely the recent leaders summit of the quad or the quadrilateral group you mentioned my recent book so i'm going to hold up this book i'm sure you can't see it on the virtual platform but the title of the book is rising to the china challenge winning through strategic patience and economic growth and i'm going to start with uh, a bit of the book um the main point which we have made in this book is that how can india rise to the challenge of china and we have been challenged on our borders now for more than a year and we believe that one of the important facets one of the important reasons why china feels that she can challenge india and other countries across the globe including australia and perhaps even the united states is because of its rising economic power and uh, in our book our recommendations are as follows that in the long term over a long period of 20 or 25 years india must focus on high speed economic growth 8 or 9% gdp growth per annum for a long period of 20 to 25 years so that the gap between india and china where its economic power is concerned or its comprehensive national power is concerned will reduce but in the short term what we have recommended in this book is that india should build countervailing counterbalancing coalitions with other countries and that brings us to the quad the quad is one of the many possible countervailing counterbalancing coalitions that india is building even as we speak and therefore coming to the first quad leaders summit which took place recently in washington dc india and all of us who follow india's foreign policy and india's policy in general cannot but feel delighted that the quad has moved at such speed over the last few months a virtual meeting in march followed by a physical a uh, first meeting of the leaders face to face a physical meeting in september and we believe that the outcomes of those meetings are very very substantial and i i'm not going into the details i think professor dabade has already spoken of it but whether you look at the area of vaccines and assistance to countries across the indo pacific and beyond the uh, beyond that whether you look at the area of climate change critical technologies space technology uh, etc i think there are some very very important areas in which the quadrilateral countries have agreed to work on so we believe that the quad the first quad summit level meeting has been a great success and what is even more important is that it has indicated very clearly that these four democracies across the indo pacific are going to be working together in the coming months and the coming years a quick word about aukus because there are a few people a few observers a few analysts who believe that the aukus or the announcement of the australia uk us um uh, decision to provide nuclear submarine technology to uh, australia has uh, dented or maybe has uh, brought down the significance of the quad in my reckoning i think this is an incorrect analysis i believe that india has clearly been saying that the quad is not a military alliance india will be happier will be more comfortable if the quad doesn't move in the direction of a military alliance and therefore i am led to believe that the quad not being a military alliance but at the same time undertaking some military activities like the malabar naval exercises the alliance part of it is left to these three countries which is aukus and therefore in my uh, estimation aukus is not a competition for the quad it is uh, uh, complementary to the quad and these two uh, developments are running 
on parallel but very close tracks to each other. Um, as far as the uh, you know the various announcements made in in Washington D.C., I agree that all four countries need to now uh, uh, tighten their belts, buckle down to implementing all those announcements, especially on the question of vaccines, where at least India got a little distracted because of the third uh, because of the second wave of the uh, uh, of the virus of the pandemic, which hit us. Uh, pretty badly in April, May, and uh, at least the first half of June. So uh, as far as uh, India is concerned, I think we uh, are very happy with uh, what has happened in Washington, D.C., the first leaders' summit. Uh, we are committed to the Quad. We will continue to work with the Quad countries. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, the implementation, the quick implementation of the announcements uh, or at least some, if not all, the announcements which were made uh, out of the meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, one last word which I think uh, I would like to end with, and which is that uh, none of the Quad documents even mentions China. But I think that is absolutely appropriate. There is no reason to mention China. But at the same time, on all fronts, whether you look at the various initiatives taken by the Quad, there is a pushback on China or to China and to what it is doing, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but across the globe. So I think there is very little doubt about the direction of the Quad. The Quad uh, is not a military alliance, but it holds the potential to strongly push back to a China or on a China, which uh, uh, could get more aggressive as we move ahead in the coming months and the coming years. So I think this is very, very clear and apparent. And uh, Dr. Dabade, if you permit me, I'm going to end there in less than 10 minutes because I think I have said everything I wanted to say about the recent uh, Quad Summit. Thank you very much uh, for the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, this was uh, very precise. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, you began rightly uh, talking about uh, what it, uh, I mean, in that sense, uh, your book, uh, which, which has just come out and you just mentioned uh, initially that uh, responding to China challenge, how it was important uh, to have that economic growth, uh, especially for countries like India. And in that sense, identifying the sinews uh, or, the, or uh, what, one, uh, what one can call the building block, uh, building blocks for taking on China over the longer term. Absolutely, you are absolutely right on that. And uh, how Quad is actually one of the many, many uh, counter coalitions uh, that are coming up uh, to uh, manage the China challenge. Uh, very important point, which uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Rajesh would also disagree about this whole question about military uh, alliance, that it is surely not a military alliance. And in fact, if you look at the debates, uh, most of them are pointing out that uh, uh, I mean, what Quad is not, uh, I mean, most of the energies have gone into uh, identifying that rather than what exactly Quad is. Uh, but again, we'll come to that later. Uh, obviously, this whole controversy about uh, AUKUS and how uh, it should be rightly seen. And there, I think many would agree that it is uh, more uh, complementary uh, to Quad uh, rather than uh, in competition with Quad. Uh, also, uh, I think uh, many of us would agree that ultimately uh, implementation, implementation is the word uh, which uh, all the countries uh, should be looking at, all the analysts would be looking at. And uh, the last point that how, though China was not mentioned, uh, how it is, Quad is all about a pushback uh, by Quad countries on China's uh, wolf warrior diplomacy or and much, much more uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. So that was uh, brilliant. So thank you so much. And with this, I invite uh, Lieutenant General uh, Narasimhan uh, to uh, make his initial remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Manish, and it's uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be on a panel like this. And uh, the hot topic, of course, has been in the last uh, week to ten days has been the UNGA and the Quad uh, meeting that was the the in-person summit that was supposed to take place. Uh, I am going to cover about eight to ten points in a short period of time. I think uh, what Quad is what is happening with Quad is firstly the growth has been uh, gradual and it is slowly maturing that you see that you know there was the initial hesitation when it restarted in 2017 and thereafter slowly it got upgraded and then you find it slowly maturing 
into into a into a proper kind of a kind of a group uh in the process of the maturing malabar was talked about you find when the in, when the quad started again in 2017 malabar was not uh, in malabar australia was not part of it it has been uh, joint uh, it has been added up very recently so it is slowly maturing that is one part of it the second is the agenda is also increasing initially when you set forth the agenda it was it was actually a uh, small number of agenda the agenda has has been expanding over a period of time now around 13 odd subjects are being dealt in in quad the third is the the multilateralism that one was act actually hoping would deliver seems to have had some kind of challenges while meeting uh, the challenges posed by the pandemic so you find that probably a smaller grouping like this would be more effective in the delivery part of it so there is a third point that 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 probably is a support to a quad the fourth aspect is that i think there is a realization that including the countries which are well off there is a need to pull in their efforts and that is the reason you find that even countries like say us which is supposed to be the most uh, economically strong country uh, that even that seems to be thinking that you know there is a need for others to pull in so this is something need to pull in pulling in the efforts is something which is uh, which is to be seen in this context and the next point is on the china's narrative of quad so most of the most of the uh, arguments around quad being a security initiative or otherwise or a defense initiative probably seems to be pushed by the agenda which which china is trying to promote in sense quad is asian nato uh, quad is doing this and that whatever the china's narrative seems to be actually coloring some of the analysis that comes up on quad and in terms of security and and military related issues on the military related issues there have been no statement basically because we all know that it is not a security kind of a initiative but there have been enough on security one thing that they talked about is cyber security which has been one of the core uh, core topics that they were discussing earlier and a working group was supposed to be given on this so cyber security has been actually very very uh, very very important in this entire thing the next thing is on the maritime security you find indo pacific being mentioned maritime security as one of the subjects being covered in quad and asean being mentioned in 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 some some forums basically as being central to this entire quad as well as the indo pacific so this is a combination that works and asean actually has gained importance because of this as 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 a particular a uh, group of countries denuclearization of the korea has been talked about in this part so while you talk about security you're talking about say maritime security cyber security now you're talking about nuclear security so this is something that again has come up as part of the security related dialogue that that needs to be looked into this particular uh, event seems to have focused a lot on the future and all the thing that they were actually looking at future were actually having an implication on security you look at advanced communication setups they talked about a open ran being being uh, being uh, deployed they talked about a semiconductor supply chain being being uh, looked into they talked about biotechnology they also talked about space whole lot of things which are actually futuristic in nature have also been looked into and the last point i have is on the on the uh, stem scholarship or the stem fellowship that that is being given by the quad this time around 100 100 or fellowship scholarships are going to be given 25 each to each country so this is something again which is extremely important there is a realization that you may like to like to probably decouple you would like to do that but do you have the wherewithal the resources to do this so you need to start building up a block by block to do that so i think this is one of the starting blocks that probably the quad has tried to create a group of people who are actually well educated and qualified in stem who can take on this mantle of somewhere around the time of decoupling and look into it in some form or the other so i think i'll stop here these are the important points i thought had come up both in the joint statement as well as in the fact sheet that came out uh, later uh, that came out on the same time i think there is enough in this in this particular statement that have been made and the fact sheet that has come out that actually if it if it can be actually delivered or if it can be achieved will will actually do a lot of good not only to these four countries and also to the region in 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 general thank you dr manish uh, uh, thank you uh, lieutenant general sir i think uh, 
very uh, very precise uh, points uh, going one by one so you talked about rightly about how uh, what one sees in the quad uh, leaders summit is really a widening of agenda and again uh, very important to that ultimately uh, it is really about a coalition of the willing that you are really uh, i mean narrowing down to three four in this case obviously four players who can actually have those uh, synergies and really uh, really pull uh, pulling their efforts uh, pulling their energies together and that is a very important point and also uh, talking about the china narrative how it is so important to respond to those narratives uh, very important domain in fact uh, we would like you to discuss more uh, during the q a about uh, the maritime security issues uh, i mean are there uh, really uh, complementarities and again uh, obviously AUKUS also throws up a challenge uh, in, in that sense so how, how do you look at it the centrality of ASEAN and obviously uh, very important uh, uh, again a very important point about decoupling uh, to what extent uh, is that really possible uh, especially uh, our interdependencies with China uh, I think that those are very important points so it's great uh, I mean fantastic points thank you so much uh, with this I uh, now invite uh, Ms. Lisa Singh uh, to make her initial remarks what do you Thank you, P Professor Manish, and uh, I'm so pleased to join with uh, so many distinguished speakers uh, for this important Indian Futures uh, uh, Forum on the Quad, uh, coming to you from Sydney this evening. I think uh, there's been already some very good points made by our respected speakers. Without repeating their points, I would like to just make a few observations. Uh, firstly, to talk about the significance and the impact of this particular Quad Summit, uh, what it means for the Australia-India relationship as it currently stands, and then also looking a bit further, a bit deeper into some of those working groups that have been formed and their deliverables, but also the challenges in terms of uh, the way the Quad has articulated its, uh, its philosophy, can I say, as being one that is open, free and uh, embracing of an international rules-based order and what that means for current conflicts within the Indo-Pacific region. So look, firstly, uh, it, very clearly this was a significant meeting, the second time that uh, Quad leaders have met at that you know, elevated leader, leader level and the first in-person leader, uh, leaders meeting. And I think we need to recall the fact that this was once held only at the ministerial level. And then, uh, you know, as we know from 2017, uh, it, it has elevated, but it, it has in its past very much been seen and perceived as lacking coherence and was almost seen as something that was going to be phased out. So. Today, that is far from the truth. Uh, the, this summit, particularly in Washington, D.C., reinforced the Quad's mandate from March, from the virtual leader summit in March, which outlined one that was moving from dialogue to one of action. And I think that is significant. Uh, the agenda of this Quad, of course, reaching far beyond non-traditional security issues, looking at the COVID-19 pandemic the, and the manufacturing supply of, of vaccines, addressing the climate crisis and the urgency of, of climate action, partnering on emerging technologies and cyberspace cooperation and infrastructure, to name just a few. But of course, all of that, of course, underpinned by um, ASEAN as a centrality part of that, the rule of law, uh, sustainable and transparent uh, investment, freedom of navigation, uh, the, the mutual respect for sovereignty, uh, and, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. So these are really important principles that were laid, laid bare. I think that India is now very much uh, more, you know, more deeply engaged in the Quad, uh, as it is with its relationship also with the United States. And it, it's clear that that is due in part to China, particularly uh, from the fallout of the conflict with their shared border. It suffice to say uh, that China was not mentioned during the Quad, but equally uh, there was, there was that uh, understanding that this, this Quad is creating a new balance in the region that can potentially constrain China. So it is helping create a new regional order. But equally, I think just as India has, has really engaged deeply in the Quad, so has Australia. 
where our, Australia's fundamentally has shifted its strategic think, thinking. It, yeah, Australia joined, of course, with the United States and Japan in the India-led 24th uh, Malabar naval exercise. Um, you know, that, that was significant in itself, even though that was outside uh, of the Quad. But on top of that, the Australia-India relationship as a standalone uh, from the Quad has been continuing to go uh, leaps and bounds in terms of its partnership. It signed a, a comprehensive strategic partnership last year, elevating its bilateral relationship. Uh, it's increased its security cooperation, uh, it, its collaboration across multiple areas, including some that are included in the Quad, such as cybersecurity, education, health, critical minerals are all part of the bilateral uh, relationship. So uh, I think this is significant. And just even recently, we had um, a two plus two ministerial dialogue in Delhi. This was an inaugural dialogue of both uh, defence and foreign ministers of both countries. And even this week, later this week, our trade minister is visiting uh, uh, Delhi to meet with your trade minister, Mr. Goyle, uh, to again uh, progress um, our efforts for a um, more open liberal trade agreement. So there's so much going on at the Australia-India level that is both in and outside of, of the quad. But I think in terms of this particular meeting, what is really significant are the fact that these working groups that were formed uh, back uh, in March have now been given a lot of deliverables. One of those I think is worth pointing to, to which is which is the, the rebooting of the pledge to donate 1 billion COVID-19 vaccines. And it's significant because it's where India is playing a, a very uh, crucial role because it is uh, the country that will manufacture and deliver uh, these particular vaccines. I think uh, you know the, the this particular uh, online tracker uh, for vaccine delivery that has been formed by by USAID, highlighting the financial and technical assistance by each quad country is is a is a very significant and shows transparency. And I think the way in the fact that uh, India has that specific role in its vaccine uh, manufacturing uh, with all quad countries donating to that pledge is, is very, very, very significant in terms of um, uh, that particular working group. Of course, the, the other working groups equally as important, the, the one on critical and emerging technologies, uh, particularly when you look at, uh, you know, resilient supply chains. For Australia, of course, that is significant because we do have a lot of rare earth minerals in, in Australia. And I, I think that Australia would see the quad as uh, representing a potential export uh, market on rare earth minerals. So uh, that particular working group is significant, as is the climate working group, because that is, again, addressing uh, uh, the, the health and the climate security of, of our region, but also the commitments that all four nations need to make uh, as they head towards COP26 in Glasgow later this year. So all of those are significant, but the thing that I think I'd like to draw on uh, tonight that, that is a, of a concern is the fact that whilst these four countries, these four nations have really committed to upholding an international rules-based order, a free and open Indo-Pacific region, it, it really does put to the test to what extent the Quad is willing to assert itself to ensure issues where democracies uh, are on the edge. And I think that that goes to obviously Myanmar. Uh, I think Myanmar could be a real opportunity for the Quad to show, uh, to, to assert itself and show that, their support for democracy in Myanmar. Uh, of course, it found special mention in the, in the joint statement uh, of the Quad leaders, both in March and in this September uh, statement as well. But to what extent does the Quad view the coup in Myanmar as a development that affects, you know, peace and security in the Indo-Pacific as worth their attention? That, I think, is the question for the Quad uh, going forward. And that has particular important um, implications for India in terms of sharing a border with Myanmar, uh, you know, potentially with an increase of refugees from Myanmar and also with the, the ongoing Chinese influence 
uh, in Myanmar. And a similar thing can be said of Afghanistan, of course, and, and the recent um, the recent takeover there by by the Taliban and what that means uh, for for coordinations, but also again, particularly for the impact on India. And we, you know, we know the concerns there are very clear in terms of uh, whether Afghanistan is going to be used as some sort of territory for harboring terrorists. Uh, there's even this week, I think, been some um, uh, terrorists. Uh, you know, infiltrating Kashmir. So th this is an ongoing concern, particularly for India, but also something that has been specifically raised uh, by all Quad leaders and in that leader's state statement. So I think there does need to be an ongoing coordinated diplomatic, economic, uh, you know, uh, human rights element to, to the Quad in addressing the issues of counter-terrorism and humanitarian cooperation in Afghanistan as well. And I, I would be interested to see how, how the Quad plays out in terms of those particular two countries and their ongoing conflicts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lisa Singh, uh, for putting out brilliantly a mm, couple of points. Uh, in fact, more than that, uh, uh, obviously, uh, I think those working groups and uh, uh, I mean, in that sense, uh, uh, very specific uh, yardsticks were identified in terms of deliverables. And I think uh, the Indo-Pacific region is going to really look up uh, to what extent has Quad been really successful in delivering on them. And uh, obviously, uh, setting uh, in Sydney, I think uh, you have a very valid, uh, I mean, uh, way of looking at it that how, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the india australia ties have really uh, widened deepened over last many many uh, i mean last few years actually uh, so i think that that's a very important that even uh, in in a way uh, what you uh, what i saw that you were hinting at was that uh, in fact the bilateral ties uh, are also a reflection of how uh, quad is now really uh, shaping up uh, in, in in a much more clearer way uh, and also uh, uh, in in a sense uh, uh, the whole question about Afghanistan, Myanmar uh, related to uh, security concerns, uh, related to more importantly questions of democracy, uh, inclusivity. I think uh, those are very valid test cases uh, for Quad in the weeks and months ahead. I think uh, that that really is uh, one thing which really stood out, uh, I thought, uh, in what you said. So uh, thank you again. And uh, with this, I invite uh, Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan. Uh, the floor is all yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Manish. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join this uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, I have, uh, you know, I, I entirely endorse all of the comments that were made earlier by all the other uh, panelists. Uh, you know, uh, don't have any major uh, disagreements, maybe one or two differences in terms of emphasis, maybe. But uh, I think, you know, as you pointed out right in the beginning, uh, the key uh, issue is how quickly the quad has moved uh, in the last year or two. Um, you know, it's, forget the fact that it is no longer you know, the notions of it being C form and whatnot, uh, but also in terms of um, having two summits uh, in a single year uh, is quite spectacular, uh, including in the, given the context of the times uh, in the middle of the pandemic, to have an in-person summit. I think so all of that is uh, indicative of the speed with which uh, the Quad has moved. And I think you know, that, that, is, uh, that is what is most noteworthy. And I think essentially this is a political statement. I mean, it's not, uh, I think it's more than anything else, it is a political statement that uh, these four countries are cooperating and that they are here to stay in the sense that they're, that, that cooperation is here to stay. I think that is important as to, you know, important to say that, uh, important to state that uh, with the, uh, with that meeting. So it, is a, it was the meeting itself, I think, um, as much as the uh, documents that are produced by the meeting, the meeting itself was a message as it were. Um, but the other, I think the other key uh, two things to sort of remember, I think one is that uh, China, in a sense, is the key, uh, even if it is not mentioned. I mean, it is the it sets the pace, as it were, um, um, in one sense, in the sense that uh, it is Chinese 
uh, behavior as much as Chinese power that has brought these countries together. And that is, uh, that is the basis of that speed with which uh, all of these countries, uh, the, the speed with which Quad has moved uh, over the last year. Uh, and we have seen a variety of um, aspects of Chinese behavior uh, over, the, over the last year, not just in India, but also it's full of warrior diplomacy. Uh, now it's hostage diplomacy. So, you know, so it, we have um, a, a, a set of uh, uh, activities that I think these countries are concerned about and that they are, they are, they are responding to. Uh, in another sense, I would also say this, that it's India that's setting the pace because the other three, of course, are uh, military alliance partners. And then in that sense, uh, they were already in a military alliance and that, you know, that, that uh, formal military alliance. So they didn't really, in that sense, um, for themselves, they didn't require for an additional sort of an alliance. But um, what they have uh, in the Quad is India added to that uh, existing uh, alliance structure, sort of bringing India into the uh, into the Pacific as a very interesting. And so, uh, but it's also that uh, the key change that has happened over the last year or so is. Um, how disappointed India has been uh, with uh, the rebuff that uh, we have had uh, after Doklam, um, uh, with all the informal summits and whatnot, that's very clear that China is not responding to anything that we have done in terms of uh, attempting to uh, raise any kind of any kind of modest event uh, in terms of, you know, we all recognize that there are differences, but uh, I think India was willing to sort of live with those differences and sort of you know, find a way to deal with those differences, but China clearly has, you know, China clearly is uh, not. And so that, uh, I think the change that uh, uh, has happened in terms of Chinese behavior towards India and the Ladakh uh, uh, and so on, I think that is a, that's a key in um, accelerating India's willingness to move as much as it has, um, and as quickly as it has, and so I think uh, going looking forward, these two, the India-China dynamic, will also to some extent drive the quad, and uh, that maybe slightly worries me in one respect, which is that um, uh, you know if uh, India, if China should find a way to pacify India, would that sort of temporarily with that sort of what would that do to the quad uh, so that that is what that's one aspect uh, I think that uh, we need to keep in mind the, the, the importance of the India China dynamic in the quad I think it is uh, quite uh, significant uh, but the other aspect is also that the China challenge as it were I mean everybody mentioned the fact that this is so broad and sort of has so many different aspects to it but if you look at the China challenge that we that the region faces that the world faces it is not a, just a military threat. It's not just a military uh, problem. Uh, it is uh, a much larger uh, problem that we face, and it is across a variety of spectrums. It is, uh, it is on trade, it's on coercive trade practices that China employs. Uh, it is uh, in terms of its uh, disregard for others uh, in, when it comes to territorial uh, and sovereignty issues. It is uh, the it is uh, you know the the ease with which China has uh, overturned or is uh, uncaring about the existing rules of not just the U.S. made global rules but also the normal uh, uh, traditional rules that we have of uh, international politics and how states behave with one another, not just in South China Sea but also across our border. So you know, so and you know, so so it's it's trade. It is uh, it is uh, on sovereignty issues. It is on security issues, but it's also on technology. I mean, the kind of pressure that it has put on a whole host of countries uh, to on Huawei, for example, um, uh, and on other technology issues. It is on it is a manner in which uh, its uh, BRI projects have been run. Uh, it is uh, also uh, in terms of. Uh, you know, on the whole COVID investigation and things like that, but also a political challenge in the sense that it's it's controlled over multilateral agencies, um, 
and the manner in which it has used multilateral agencies and other um, other uh, uh, smaller multilateral groupings like the EU, the manner in which it has tried to divide these groups, um, picking off as it were the weakest link within those groups. So, in the, the challenge, in a sense, it is a very very broad challenge, and so. The response, uh, I think, what we are seeing uh, in the Quad statement is that the response is also has to be uh, not just a military response, but it also has to be a fairly broad response that addresses all of these different issues uh, in terms of technology, in terms of economic coercion, uh, it is also the supply chain resilience, and uh, maybe eventually decoupling at some stage. Um, you know, so uh, a variety of areas in which that cooperation is required. And so we find that uh, we, you know, that, 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 uh, that uh, in one sense it is it is uh, understandable that we have this very very broad response, and I think that's the right way to do it. Um, uh, but uh, if there is an element, there's some aspects of security that is included towards the end of these statements and whatnot. But uh, I think that uh, eventually that has to become a bit stronger. I mean, I, I you know I think all of these other challenges are important, but the security challenge. Uh, Maybe for uh, understandable reasons, they have been sort of uh, somewhat quiet about that part, but um, not really emphasize that part. But I think that has to be that has that's already happening. Obviously, the, 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 there is a certain amount of um, security cooperation that is happening within the Quad. Of course, as I said, three of them are already uh, uh, security treaty allies, but also with India, not just in terms of Malabar, but also in a variety of other ways in terms of. Um, Quad countries, some quad countries having people stationed in Gurugaon, for example, the naval, uh, at the naval center in Gurugaon, uh, uh, monitoring center. So, so there is a and there, uh, there is obviously intelligence cooperation going on. But I think that that is maybe subterranean at this point. But that cooperation needs to be uh, emphasized. I think it needs to sort of uh, increase more. I'm a little bit concerned maybe about a few issues which I don't think are central to the Quad. Um, um, Afghanistan is not central to the Quad. I don't think Myanmar uh, is central to the Quad. Um, uh, you know, I, so these are, uh, North Korea is not central to the Quad. I think those, uh, uh, the, all the other aspects, I mean, whether this vaccine, all of that is central to the Quad. I, I think these three issues, uh, sometimes uh, it happens that everybody's first project also get involved in, in these kind of multilateral, multilateral sort of meetings. I hope it doesn't sort of become <laughs> too heavy and sort of weigh down um, the rest of the cooperation. But um, this happens in NAM meetings, but I, I would hope that in BRICS summits and whatnot, we have this whole uh, array of things that are everybody's pet prob problems and concerns that get added on because nobody wants to negotiate on those things. But uh, but I, I hope that that doesn't sort of become too heavy over a period of time. But uh, but I think that that you know that um, overall what we have seen is um, uh, is uh, enormously satisfying and um, and understandable at some level. But going forward, uh, I think a key issue is that, uh, and this is kind of a problem that as we move forward. Not just in court, but in the broader relationship within between Asian Indo-Pacific powers, that all of these countries uh, face slightly different problems with China uh, in terms of the seriousness of the, in, in terms of totality, it's, it's all the same, but in terms of the level of seriousness, it's all slightly different problem. And uh, as it were, the priority is, but also the capacity to meet those challenges is slightly different. Uh, and so partnerships and alliances are always. There is always negotiations over the burden sharing aspects of it. And that is going to be an issue uh, over time. India is much more capable. Uh, you know, Japan is less so, Australia is even less so. So the, you know, the, how do we negotiate those burden sharing aspects? Um, uh, there are ways in which one can, can be done, but I think that those are issues. But maybe that is too much to expect that at just at an early meeting, at just an early space that we will sort of discuss those, but I think that too, those are areas that we have to go to. But let me stop here. I don't want to take too much time and, you know, look forward to questions and comments. Thank you, Anish. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rajesh. Uh, I think, as always, uh, uh, very uh, clear points, uh, very clear uh, line of thinking.
so obviously uh, very important point i think uh, you made was that ultimately the quad leaders uh, joint statement should be seen more uh, as a, a political statement rather than uh, uh, more than that it's it is really uh, a diplomatic strategic signaling of sorts and again uh, how uh, china in fact uh, remains the key driver of the entire quad uh, uh, process and here actually i mean this whole made in china that quad is actually really a made in china and the future trajectory in fact would also be driven by uh, china's uh, policies in in, in the uh, times ahead uh, obviously on india uh, 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 the state of india uh, china relations uh, you obviously with uh, after doklam galwan i think uh, those have really pushed india uh, into a tighter embrace of quad and again uh, i think uh, a very valid point which you said about the china challenge that it is really a larger problem uh, not just confined uh, to the uh, to to, to uh, just military issues so it is really cutting across i think that's a uh, point well taken that it is really cutting across various frontiers uh, trade uh, technology pointed out uh, obviously uh, very important and again uh, here i think uh, we have uh, uh, a difference uh, with uh, ms lisa saying about uh, why uh, in that sense afghanistan myanmar or north korea uh, these questions are not central uh, to what uh, quad uh, seeks to achieve so thank you so much uh, uh, again for those uh, lovely insights uh, uh, this we now open up uh, to q and a uh, and what what i do is we already have questions uh, flowing in uh, including from ambassador vishnu prakash uh, but let me uh, just have uh, maybe uh, uh, i mean i had a couple of questions for each of you but i'll stick to just one for the positive time and maybe we can start with ambassador uh, bambawale and uh, sir uh, one of the points which you talked about was that uh, this is surely not a military alliance uh, but uh, uh, can you uh, tell us uh, to what extent uh, uh, is that a muzzled uh, uh, diplomatic signaling uh, wouldn't it uh, help uh, if uh, if in that sense a signal goes out uh, strongly that it is really and obviously uh, uh, what what uh, i mean uh, different parts of the statement or different uh, uh, i mean uh, statements are making those very clear but uh, would that uh, uh, i mean harping on that element wouldn't that serve or give a better leverage of sorts for the quad countries well uh, in answer to your question uh, manish let me just say that as far as India is concerned, and we have been um, saying this to our quad partners for several years now, and they have accepted it. So it is there, um, uh, you know, in our common understanding also, that the quad is not a military alliance. At the same time, the quad, the quad countries do undertake joint military activities like the Malabar naval exercise. And what this points to is that the Quad is a potential military coalition. I won't use the word alliance, but a potential military coalition if push comes to shove or when push comes to shove. So we are here as a group of democratic countries believing in an open, uh, transparent system. Uh, but if you push us too much, then uh, there is the potential of us pushing back, not just diplomatically and politically, but also militarily. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think this signaling is pretty clear. I definitely think it is clear to the Chinese. And that is why they dislike the Quad so much. That is why their foreign minister on one occasion, as you yourself said, very publicly said, that the quad is like sea foam on a beach, which dissipates when it hits the beach. Well, I think what the current meeting has proved is that this is not sea foam and it is not dissipating. Uh, thanks, Ambassador. Uh, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Narsimhan, sir, uh, uh, one of the very important areas uh, you identified was uh, maritime security. So uh, what, what are the uh, maybe uh, complementarities uh, you see uh, which uh, all the Quad countries can really build on? Uh, you see, it, it's not only typically coming, coming with military force to do something. Maritime security involves a lot of other things in terms of, say, illegal and unreported fishing, in terms of maritime domain awareness, in terms of uh, HADR, I mean, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, 
there are a number of things which can be done as far as this maritime uh, maritime uh, security is concerned so th that is that is what i wanted to say because it it is one thing to only look at you know the moment the word security comes i'm i'm sure one i think mr patia has mentioned that security means military somewhere uh it need not necessarily be for all secure the word the moment the security comes we don't have to associate with the military force operating and doing something there are many many aspects of security today i didn't talk about one one of the biotechnologies one of the thing that has been talked about in quad today bio safety and bio security is one of the major issues that the world is going to face so there are number of issues that we need to do maritime in maritime security there are number of thing that one can do anti piracy for once anti piracy illegal and unreported fishing maritime domain awareness underwater domain awareness uh, hadr whole lot of things can be done so that that's what i would like to answer you thank you sir uh, uh, ms lisa singh uh, uh, i mean coming back uh, to the question about uh, why do you think uh, maybe you can flag out in slightly more detail uh, why do you think uh, the whole question of either afghanistan or myanmar are so central uh, to uh, the quad ideas Uh, about democracy, about rule of law. Uh, you can please unmute. Yeah. Thank you, Manisha. Look, I think um, you know the the Quad uh, leader's statement uh, has it written there for for themselves. The fact that they have focused on the the conflicts of Myanmar and Afghanistan. Having having said that, I take the point that this is not. Um, you know a military alliance this is this is a group of four nations that have focused uh, beyond uh, traditional security uh, threats they've looked at uh, you know non traditional security areas as well but i think we do need to recognize that the, the the quad does signal to beijing that these are four states that share uh, the intent to counter and they thereby de deter future chinese actions to further change the status quo in the indo-pacific region of course then on top of that we have orcus which is a much more uh traditional security uh treaty treaty uh, alliance in a sense uh, that will add to this but if you look at the fact that 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 being the quad's focus and then you move to uh the issues of china particularly as it advances in investing in strategic infrastructures including ports as we know and the like then Myanmar does come into play because uh at the moment with uh, Myanmar for example uh China has been involved in some major infrastructure projects pipelines a dam now there's the China Myanmar economic corridor and it will be gaining overland access to the Indian Ocean through Myanmar Tatmadaw is close has very close links to Beijing so that is all playing out at the same time as the democracy um and the conflict within uh, you know the domestic spheres of, of Myanmar are also playing out and and so here is the quad making it very clear, clear that it stands by an international rules based order democracy you know it has of course within its four nations that one of the biggest democracies in the world so these are really important tenants for the quad but also play out in terms of that broader security sense and what it means for the region and particularly for india in terms of its shared borders uh both with china and with myanmar of course afghanistan is a different is a different game uh and and we all know the the issues that are playing out in afghanistan now and what they particularly mean uh for india is 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 something you know you know quite unique i i know that india had has invested quite a lot of infrastructure uh investments in uh, afghanistan which are now uh jeopardized by by the current taliban regime but i think more more of an issue is this uh the threat of harboring terrorists uh within uh, uh afghanistan that is a serious security concern if it becomes that sort of uh terrorist hub for activities uh particularly if it has a you know an increase of pakistan's influence trade investment though of course the the economic side of of the of the quad is worth uh, investigating in terms of afghanistan because uh, there was uh, you know quite a lot of investment in terms of um um uh infrastructure and, and the like with with afghanistan particularly again as i said with with india um i think again china uh you know its eagerness to establish uh, friendly friendly relations with the tab taliban 
uh, along with Pakistan's influence, uh, means that, you know, uh, that could also play out as a, a very unstable uh, sort of environment, uh, particularly for India. So I think all of that means that, uh, you know, India finds itself within the quad, uh, uh, you know, it, with, with a very strong alliance uh, for, for the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, Australia, again, has very strong shared interests in India's interest in counterterrorism for the like, and we are strengthening our bilateral relationship in, in relation to counterterrorism. Uh, you know, we, again, like India, sought safe passage for Afghanis, uh, 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 leaving Afghanistan's foreign nationals and the like. So, you know, I think this, the, you know, all of this uh, brings into question this, the, the sort of security nature of the Quad, uh, how it sees itself playing, playing out that more hard security, traditional security role having, you know, considering it's not a military alliance, it, it is a group of like-minded countries that have come together to address these specific concerns. But I think that, that there's definitely a role here for the Quad to play, and it may not be so uh, pronounced at this point in time with its very bold agenda on, on so many other um, non-traditional security areas, COVID vaccines, climate change and the like. Uh, but I think long-term, uh, I think that some of these... Uh, conflict areas will need to be addressed by, by Quad member nations. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Rajesh uh, Rajkopalan, uh, if one looks at uh, the four Quad countries, uh, India in that sense, uh, many would argue, is the weakest link because the other three are actually tied by history of, uh, again, habits of cooperation. So uh, do you sense now that India is much more uh, a willing uh, partner uh, uh, in the Quad, other than obviously, I mean, India is making a statement by joining Quad, but do you see that uh, India has made a strategic uh, decision that uh, it is really going to be uh, take the China uh, challenge head on, obviously uh, post Galwan uh, or even going back to Roklam. Uh, do you see that uh, firm decision uh, uh, in the Indian, Indian establishment, sir? Well, it's a difficult question to answer because obviously I'm not in the Indian establishment, but um, it does, uh, you know, it, it seems as of now, at least, that uh, we recognize that this is a serious, uh, that China is not amenable to, uh, to uh, our entreaties about, uh, you know, finding a modus vivendi to work out our differences and to sort of uh, bracket our differences and move on. But, um, but you know, uh, but if you look at the, some of the statements that I have, uh, uh, from I mean, the MEA on China, it is about uh, China recognizing the, what the mistakes they made is are the dark, uh, or uh, their unilateralism as it were, uh, uh, in, you know, in terms of not taking into taking on board uh, our concerns. Uh, so, so those those are uh, to me it seems like those are fairly simple and straightforward uh, issues and. I can only defend, I mean, I want to say that China is rather foolish in the manner in which it is sort of, um, in the, the, the manner in which it is approaching these uh, problems that it has with India. So, uh, you know, these are, um, what we are asking of China is fairly small. I mean, it's not that we are asking a lot of China. And so uh, a kind of concern remains that if China were willing to grant uh, or go half, go, go a decent distance in meeting some of the concerns that we have, both with regard to uh, territorial issues, uh, but also with regard to things that, uh, you know, them not taking uh, taking our concerns seriously or being sensitive to our concerns, uh, doesn't seem to be a whole, that's not a, that's not a big ask. Um, so what happens if they become smarter uh, in terms of um, dealing with these Two key issues. I think they have one or two other issues, but these yes, these are the two ones that are at the top of the pile, as it were. Um, would our um, would India's sort of uh, approach to Quad and other thing, other sort of uh, partnerships change uh, if China were smarter in approaching uh, these problems with India? Uh, so that remains an issue because for me, uh, the real problem is not just China's behavior, but also China's power. And that doesn't change. Uh, one of the things that obviously that we learn in international politics is that 
uh, you know, intentions can change on a dime, but uh, capabilities don't. And so uh, China's power uh, uh, will remain a problem for a long time to come. I mean, we can think about potentially 20, 30 years down the line when we might start to close the gap with China, but uh, assuming everything else happens, but you know, uh, happens well in the meantime for us, but uh, that is a long way off and we have to get there. And so those that, those long periods are not particularly safe uh, if tomorrow they would, you know, even if they are more uh, kinder towards us today, if they change their minds later. So, so in a sense, uh, looking only at their behavior, I think is a bit of a problem. Um, and so uh, I would be more concerned about some of those issues. So to the, sorry about the long-winded answer, but the, but I'm I'm a little bit concerned, let's say. I mean, because what we're asking for is in terms of changes in Chinese behavior. Um, and those are not big asks. Um, and I uh, I mean, I, I, I suppose we have to depend on China's stability to sort of uh, maintain uh, be, uh, maintain India where it is. Great, sir. <clears throat> With this, now we open up uh, to uh, other participants and if we are very happy uh, and uh, I mean honored to have Ambassador Vishnu Prakash with us, uh, who has been India's former ambassador to uh, Canada and South Korea. So over to you, sir. Sorry to keep you waiting this long. Thank you very much. Greetings and uh, Manish, compliments for a wonderful dialogue. What a distinguished panel. Uh, I've enjoyed or benefited from the insights. I'll take uh, the comment or the point that uh, Professor Raja Gopalan has mentioned further. I have two concerns, uh, rather two posers. One is what is the core agenda of Quad? And second is uh, when the joint statement starts to get longer, I start to worry. Uh, from two paras uh, to two pages to multiple pages, I mean, this is uh, a phenomena that is quite dangerous. Let me come to the first point. You know, as I see it, the core, the raison d'etre of Quad is a free and open Indo-Pacific region, a coercion-free environment, a rule of law. Now, if that is the case, and we all know that uh, when we talk of free and open Indo-Pacific or coercion-free environment, we are not referring to uh, Australia or India or US or Japan, we are referring to one country. Now, if the country concerned does not, uh, uh, does not follow the rules of engagement, what does Quad do? So unless Quad has the ability also to walk the talk and the whole premise of uh, the formation of Quad, I think falls flat. So, uh, and we all remember that, you know, first we were, no, we are not even admitting that there was a meeting, then we were very reluctant to call it Quad, et cetera, et cetera. So is it or is it not that maritime security, not uh, in, the, in the broadest sense, including the free and open Indo-Pacific is the raison d'etre, that's one. Second is the best way to sap the energies of any organization is to overload the agenda. Now, we, we can keep on piling on things. I mean, everything is important. I am not for a minute saying it's not important, but does Quad have the bandwidth to take on all these uh, aspects that we have uh, enumerated? And should we not focus on the core agenda and build further? I'll request the comments of uh, all the panelists if possible. Thank you. Great, sir. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, can we take a couple of questions before I also ask other, I mean, all the panelists to respond. So we have with us, uh, uh, Mr. Ravi Bhatia uh, has been, uh, has a question uh, in the chat box. So uh, is, uh, uh, sir, would you like to uh, ask? Okay, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Ayushi Ketkar uh, is with us. So yes, Ayushi, please go ahead. Thank you, Manish ji. Uh, am I audible? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my questions are for Rajesh, sir. Two short questions. One, uh, do you think, sir, uh, that a negative impulse can be the basis for long-term positive engagement? Because as we see, China seems to be the main reason for the formation of Quad itself. So uh, do you think this will sustain in the long run? Because we have examples where 
uh, you've had USA and USSR at one point coming together to fight the to fight Germany, but uh, after World War II, they uh, became you know uh, everyone knows what the history is, the Cold War and everything. So uh, that's one question. And second, sir, uh, do you think AUKUS uh, will be detrimental to India's interest as the net security provider in the Indian Ocean region? Because uh, somewhere uh, the formation of AUKUS uh, seems, I mean, with the, ma the main reason for it is to be the main, uh, you know, they're looking at maritime security in that sense. So do you think that will be detrimental to India's interest? Thank you so much. Thank you. Rajat, please go ahead. Please unmute yourself, Rajat. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is to Professor Lisa Singh. Uh, uh, Professor Singh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Australia India Institute for uh, last Wednesday uh, hosting a discussion of my uh, one of the chapter of my forthcoming book that was on uh, India US relation during the uh, UPA government uh, that is Professor uh, Timothy Lynch. So I think uh, uh, Professor uh, Kavir Pradeep Taneja actually uh, <coughs> chaired the session. So uh, thanks to uh, the Australian Indian Institute for this. So my question uh, to Professor Singh is uh, regarding this interrelation between this uh, Quad and AUKUS. So uh, it's, although it's officially, it has not been announced that uh, Quad, uh, any military content of the uh, Quad, uh, that it is a military alliance, uh, there is no such have been, uh, there have been no such uh, official announcement, but the analysts and researchers has always uh, had a feeling that uh, this is, as uh, just now Ambassador Vishnu Prakash uh, told that it is for free and open Indo-Pacific. Indo so this by impl uh, uh, implication, uh, this implies that uh, this this must have some security uh, content or at least some security dimensions. Now, under these circumstances, uh, do you not think that uh, instead of uh, forging one more alliance like OCAS, uh, it would have been better, as, as, as I had mentioned in one of my previous uh, papers, uh, that uh, the Britain could be added in uh, Quad to make it more, uh, if, uh, to make it stronger. So, uh, in, of course, in that case, we'll have to change the name from Quad to maybe Pentagonal Security Initiative or something. But uh, the point is that what was the need for uh, an, one more alliance uh, with just three countries instead of uh, had we uh, could not have been Britain uh, added to Quad itself rather than uh, forging one more alliance like AUKUS. Thank you. We can start with Professor Rajesh. This question is to Professor Lisa Singh. Yeah, thank you. I'm start the q and I mean, we begin with uh, Professor Rajesh uh, responding. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, so the, the question about capacity, I think that is an important issue that Ambassador Ocean Prakash uh, raised. Um, but I, you know, I, uh, the capacity issue, I, obviously we will have to wait and see uh, whether uh, uh, the Quad countries can bring together and address all of these different areas. But I would sort of go back to what I was saying, which is that there is a the problem that we face uh, vis a vis China is a broad problem. I mean, so in a sense, it has to be, uh, and I think. The idea of four countries coming together, and maybe more, uh, coming together sort of to deal with it uh, is to pool uh, all of our resources. I think, as, as Ambassador Gautam Bambawal had made, uh, mentioned earlier, that so that we can sort of meet that challenge. I mean, but we have to meet that challenge because uh, whether you know trade, I, every country that has faced China's trade coercion in Australia most recently, but everybody, I mean, Norway, Canada. Or New Zealand, I mean, you know, Sweden, um, I mean, you know, all of these countries essentially were on their own. I mean, they, they kind of suffered on their own and uh, everybody sort of, um, you know, kept their heads down below the parapet. So that, I think, uh, so that, you know, so it is, it has to be, it has to be met together because it's going to be difficult for each country to individually meet and go back to old notions of interdependence as, uh, 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 you know, Kyohen uh, and I talked about it a long time back because this is not interdependent. What we have, 
economically is not interdependence. Interdependence is where both sides are equally dependent uh, on the trade. And what we have is a lot of dependence on China. Anyway, everybody's economy is dependent on China. So that makes it very difficult for each country, whether it's Australia or New Zealand or even India, to sort of uh, uh, to address that particular problem alone. But it has to, so, you know, there has to be some strategies, other than some common approaches evolved to deal with that. Uh, and um, so a lot of that is maybe policy. I mean, I think the on the COVID vaccine part, yes, there is capacity involved. But the other part, uh, on a lot of the other part, technology, there's definitely capacity issues involved. Um, but uh, but some of these issues uh, is a question of coordinating our policies and sort of meeting, making sure that we take, if one country is threatened, then uh, other countries sort of uh, finding a way to coordinate their responses to China so that India or Australia or uh, whichever other country is threatened is not on their own. I mean, they're not dealing with China on, its, on their own. So I think that can be done. But I think even on the capacity issues, even though on technology, on uh, vaccines, things like that, capacity uh, or infrastructure capacity is an issue. I mean, but I think, uh, and definitely time will tell, but these are challenges that have to be met. There is, uh, and not no single country can do that. Uh, so they, 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 it, it, this is not, um, uh, this is something that needs to be managed. And so I'm not sure, I, I agree with you, Ambassador uh, Prakash, on the challenge that it poses, but I think these are all uh, challenges that have to be seriously addressed and met. And I have the doubts, I, I think Ambassador uh, Prakash is correct, I mean, but we still need to sort of uh, deal with that, with that problem because it's such a wide spectrum challenge rather than just a security challenge. Uh, on question about negative impulse, I mean, you know, alliances are always negative. It's always against somebody, not not for something. So, I mean, we'll say all kinds of nice things about uh, you know about things that bring us together. That is not negative. Positive things that bring us together, but it's ultimately all negative. And those, you know, uh, as long as the concerns remain, as long as all of us remain concerned about the same, as as, the, as long as we share those mutual concerns with China or whatever the, whatever the country it is. Uh, we will be together. I mean, you know, so yes, the Second World War alliance did last, uh, outlast the Second World War, but NATO has survived for uh, how many decades now? So, you know, so it depends on whether the purpose remains um, and whether the, whether, the, whether the concern that led to that formation of that coalition, whether that concern stays uh, and whether we can agree on how to address that concern. So I think that uh, by itself is, should not be a, duration should not be a, an issue. And again, uh, of course, you know, as many hands as we can get to push that wheel, I'm fine. I mean, I have no problem. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's uh, I, it's all of it goes towards the same purpose, right? I mean, and uh, and I have no problem with, um, with with a lot of others coming to our assistance. I hope Russia would also join us, but you know, Russia is where it is for whatever reasons. But uh, you know, as many countries as, uh, as can be brought together, uh, and we have done a lot of planning. Right? I mean, we have trilaterals that are brought in. This, the standard pattern, I think it's a good pattern, which is two quad countries bringing in a third non-quad country. And we have done this a number of times. Uh, we have done it with France. We have done it with Indonesia. So, you know, so all of these trilaterals that uh, we have formed, that other quad member countries have formed, are good because they bring in essentially the quad countries with a country that shares the same concerns, but which is not part of the quad. And, you know, so it kind of expands the tent. I mean, so I, I have no real problem uh, uh, with uh, with that. So let me stop here until uh, others can also address. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Visa Singh, maybe you would like to respond? Uh, thank you, Manish. Look, I, I think uh, this, you know, going back to the Ambassador Prakash's uh, question about what is what really is the Quad uh, in terms of what is it standing for? Is it a gen is it is its agenda to too large and you know when the uh, statements are getting too long does that replicate that i think it's worth unpacking mm -hmm. some of the um initiatives that have been defined in this particular leaders summit because some of them are simply launching an initiative for example into you know mapping capacity of uh, supply chain security for you know looking at semiconductors for the for example that is, that is a launch of an initiative. It, it's got a long way to play out. Other parts are more direct action. And that is where I think the, the vaccine diplomacy angle is, is very important. They've given themselves a target by the end of next year 
to have delivered to the developing parts, particularly of the Indo-Pacific, uh, 1 billion vaccines. Now, if that is achieved, that can be written off the uh, quad agenda and they don't need to keep such a bold agenda there. But uh, look, I, I think it is worth coming back to what, what is really defining the quad here. And that goes to the other question about AUKUS, because I think there is scope, to be honest, to include the UK into the quad. Uh, you know, I, I think the UK would probably not say no to that if it was proposed. But this, this there, therein lies then what is the quad's purpose? Because if you are including the UK, then it does bring into line the quad having a much more traditional security focus. Of course, the UK has, has been in the Indo-Pacific region for some time as a, as a maritime security player. Uh, and now, of course, is playing that role out through AUKUS with Australia and the, U and the US. But I think, uh, you know, the potential is there for the quad to be expanded. But at the same time, I think it goes back to addressing exactly, you know, whether or not it's going to continue along this path of a broader agenda of looking at health security, climate security and the like, or whether it is going to be more in line with AUKUS and actually address some of the, 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 the more hard security threats in the region, which of course we know is, is coming from the one country that the Quad uh, refuses to name. Thank you, Ms. Lisa. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Rasuman, would you like to respond? Okay, Ambassador Yeah, sure. Can you hear me, Manish? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll I'll try to uh, answer Ambassador Vishnu Prakash's question because it's a very uh, good and relevant question. Um, you know, there can be any number of pages uh, of a joint statement put out by the Quad, but I think all of us, that is the people who um, are parts of the government and uh, of the Quad countries are very clear of what the main objective of the Quad is. And that is what is important. And what they are clear about is that if the rise of China is going to be less than peaceful as it uh, seems to be today, then the Quad countries have the potential to push back. And I don't mean only militarily, but otherwise also, uh, the Quad countries have the potential to push back at China. So I, I think it all depends on if, if you have a rising China and China is going to rise further, there's no doubt about that. But if this rising China suddenly has a change of heart and plays by the international rules of uh, the game, both political, economic and elsewhere, then I think, uh, you know, none of us will have a problem. But because all indications are that they do not play by those rules, uh, there may be a point in time in the future when a serious pushback would be required. So I think that is very clear and any number of pages of documents, et cetera, um, you know, uh, uh, yes, uh, they seem to be confusing covert overtly, but I think covertly without having said anything, the objective of the Quad is very, very clear to all the four governments involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bumbawale. We have uh, time for two very short, quick questions. So, uh, uh, yes, Amiti, please go ahead. Please introduce yourself first. Yeah. Uh, good evening, panelists. I'm Amiti Pandey, a student of uh, University of Mumbai, uh, International Relations as my course. So I have a very short and a very crisp question to, uh, you know, Mr. Bambavle, sir, as uh, there's a lot of comprehensive uh, emphasis on uh, increasing the economic strata of the countries, I mean, especially the Quad countries. And uh, at the same time, we see an extensive emphasis on the climate crisis and achieving the climate ambition, as discussed in the Quad collaboration. I would uh, just like to know, it would be great to know a little more from his end that how uh, how can we walk the talk that has been discussed in the quad by keeping in mind the uh, you know economic uh, economic growth and not hampering it while maintaining the uh, while maintaining or reaching towards the climate action plan uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, 
yeah the last question from wing commander punit chatta uh yes sir good evening i am a phd scholar at central university of uh, gujarat i have just a, a small question has india lost in a big way by joining quad has there any been uh, tangible gain for us like uh, australia got its nuclear submarine technology by being uh, part of aukus and other uh, things like that but uh, us uh, if you can see they did a belligerent act uh, on april 7th by exercising their freedom of uh, navigation operations without informing the quad partner if they would have asked us we would have definitely said yes being that but have we become a lesser partner in this way or is this a sign of things to come thanks uh, puneet uh, so uh, mr bamba wale would you like to respond yeah i would uh, like to respond to both questions and i'll do that very briefly so that the other panelists could also weigh in uh, on the first question of by amiti i i must say amiti i am not an expert on green growth but the answer to um, to uh, you know is green growth with that means uh, we continue to grow at a high rate of gdp growth per annum uh, but we also ensure that it's clean so i i don't know if uh, how that is to be achieved i am i'm not an expert on that subject so i'll i'll leave it at that and uh, to the second question i would say that you know uh, i i don't think india has lost out by being part of the quad in fact india is the difference you know as we have been saying in a number of the panelists have already said that the us japan and australia are treaty allies who is new in this uh, grouping it's india so i think uh, you know it is um, we we are we stand to gain from this grouping and we also stand to gain because while in the long run are uh, uh, you know the what we need to do in the long run is of course to have a high gdp growth over an extended period of time of 20 25 or 30 years but in the shorter run we need to build these balancing or countervailing coalitions and the quad is just one of those and that helps us that is in india's national interest in the short to medium term so i'll stop there manish Uh, thank you sir uh, lieutenant general uh, narsimhan is uh, with us so uh, i mean you will have the last word for today let me just see where i can unmute myself first <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Can, you. You, can you hear me yes sir right uh, there are there are two three points firstly this core agenda of quad which was talked about uh, please put the things in time frame the second edition of quad started in 2017 indo pacific came in 2018 so i don't think quad was actually a reason for indo pacific or vice versa so it, these are two different things that we need to probably disaggregate a little bit on the long statement part of it i agree with ambassador vishnu prakash in the sense that the problem will be in implementation and they need to probably concentrate on the implementation part of it and if that could be done obviously then uh, we should be generally be all right in that particular sense uh the third thing is on the um, aukus being detrimental to india i think aukus is something which is if you look at that joint statement which has come out most of the paragraphs do, uh, deal with security and uh, defense related issues except for one paragraph in which it talks about cyber security it also talks about uh, artificial intelligence and also quantum technologies so there is a technological component to that particular particular statement which has come out but all the same it is more defense oriented and there are only two partners of quad which are part of aukus japan is also not part of it we are also not part of it and so it is a little different kind of a setup and so i don't think that is going to impinge or interact too much with 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 quad part of it the uh, there's one question about whether india has lost a big way in quad i think uh, wing commander punita punita i think uh, asked about this please understand fawn ops in indian ocean has been an ongoing thing for a very long time this time around it got this time around it got publicized so much but otherwise freedom of navigation operations have been going on in in, in our neighborhood for a very long time and this is something that we need to take it as as a normal procedure or normal kind of activity which the us navy uh, does all the time uh, there was also a question about whether uk should have been just brought on to quad 
some time ago i am sure you all would have realized that there was a there was some talk of quad plus and quad plus countries could be any anything could have been in the region but i think that has taken a back seat over a period of time and for and for probably for want of want of actually like mindedness is what i would say so what is your purpose of joining quad is something that we need to be keeping in mind and in any case uh, there are some panelists which have said that you know ultimately quad is about china but my understanding is that quad was not about china at least when it started and even now yes there has been a lot of narratives of analysts talking about yes these four countries are actually trying to neutralize china or to counter china but i don't think that was the reason why uh, why this thing actually started and unlike uh, dr rajesh rajagopalan mentioned three of them are alliance partners and we are the only person who is out of the alliance and please don't forget we do have a continental issue with china so this is something which is different so that is the reason why there was there was some kind of uh, a different kind of an approach to quad from indian side so i think if you put all this in one one uh, one basket you will find that generally uh, quad has got a specific purpose which was given in those 13 subjects which have been being dealt with in many forums it has been spoken about and it doesn't not, it does not talk about the security related issues other than the ones like cyber security maritime security etc and it also doesn't talk about a defense kind of a coalition or a cooperation or a partnership so this is something that we need to be uh, keeping in mind and be careful of thank you uh, thank you sir and with this uh, we have come to uh, exactly 90 minutes of what we had promised today so great to have uh, uh, you all with us uh, in fact we are also joined by professor rajesh kharat Uh, who is a dean of social sciences in uh, mumbai university so thank you sir also for joining us uh, with this i now invite uh, shubhranshu to give a formal vote of thanks over to you shubhranshu on behalf of the team indian futures i subhranshu prakim sharma would like to extend our gratitude uh, to the distinguished speakers of this esteemed panel uh, ambassador gautam bambawale sir uh, lieutenant general asl narasimha sir uh, lisa singh ma'am and professor rajesh rajagopalan sir i would also like to extend our gratitude to all the esteemed participants of this panel and we look forward to hosting you in our future programs soon and please follow us in our social media handles on youtube instagram and twitter at the red indian futures thank you stay safe thank you very much for joining us thanks